Okay, so another live stream. This live stream is going to be with Rogue Micro LLC again, or Tess. And we're going to talk a bit about um, all kinds of things related to cannabis, like allergens and things like that. Uh, and other sorts of things related to immune system response and what you can do to keep yourself from being exposed to these things or minimize or mitigate them as much as possible. Tess is already in the chat though, so let me go and uh, bring them in. Essentially, they have a presentation, and this will also be on my YouTube channel. And uh, you'll, yeah, you'll see some of the, the images. <laughs> yeah, you'll have some of the images for um, for later if you had trouble seeing them or anything like that. So, hey, Tess. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and if anyone cannot hear her, you know, let us know in the chat. Sweet. All right, I'm not used to playing with my phone, so this is really fun. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks for inviting me on. Um, I know that we uh, there's been a lot of chatter about, um, you know, allergies, COPD, a lot of workers who have respiratory issues. Um, when they, you know, work with cannabis, they might develop rashes, things like that. So um, there can be different reasons why that could happen. Um, there could be, you know, uh, chemical exposures. There's chemical irritants that might be in cannabis, like terpenes. I mean, I used to do steam distillation of terpenes back in the day when I worked in cannabis manufacturing. And that shit will degrade plastic. So like, it's pretty, it's a pretty um, uh, strong substance when it's at high concentrations. Um, and we can definitely talk about that, but what I'm going to focus on today is more allergenic proteins, like substances produced by cannabis, um, and then other types of allergens that we know are respiratory issues or skin contact or food allergies, and, um, you know, what, what, what you can do to prevent um, and uh, what you can expect from hopefully from your employer to protect you. So, so yeah, I don't know if we have any questions or if you have any uh, questions just to get started, Matthew, um, because I did prepare some slides like a good nerdy scientist, but I don't want to be like super presentation-y. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think that, uh, something that you've talked about a lot and that we've seen a lot in the in the social media space is for those who aren't actually aware um it's a huge controversial subject right because on the one hand it being like how do you regulate this sort of thing and even if you're not in like, like a commercial like space you still might like want to because this doesn't really matter it's not like it only exists in the commercial space this exists everywhere all the time all at once you know, and, and so you're dealing with these problems, uh, whether you're in a commercial space or not. And some people, like I saw recently, there's a comment, like, especially with aspergillus testing, right? This has been a, a huge brouhaha. But also, like, you know, like, uh, you don't know how you're going to respond to, to some of these things. You can't just, like, you know, scan yourself with some kind of tricorder and be like, oh, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to have no problem. You know, some people get as terrible as this to say, and it's not the it's not the typical case. Some people will get sensitized even from like exposure to soil and just digging in the soil, right? Like it just happens, and you don't know how you're going to react. And depending on how old you are and a bunch of other factors, those are going to influence you. And I think you have a good graphic about that too. So yeah, yeah. Well, um, should I just like dive into my nerd stuff? Is that like? <laughs> You I'm gonna kind of look probably. through. <laughs> okay, nerd stuff away. Here we go. All right, let's see if I can figure out how to do computer phone things. All right, so presentation on my computer screen. Zoo, zoo. So <laughs> this slide here is a pretty funny meme that I think is hilarious because it's your like immune system, right? It's like walking the beat. It's totally passing up bacteria, viruses, parasites 
cancer cells, and then it focuses in on a peanut. And that's kind of what happens when you have allergies. Like a peanut has a bunch of different proteins that aren't necessarily harmful to you, but your immune system is treating them as if they are. So your immune system really reacts. Um, and there's different allergens within peanuts and other things you can be allergic to. So uh, I think that this does a good job of really showing like what really happens. And there's a bunch of different ways that you can have allergic reactions. A lot of people, uh, like I was saying, you know, if you are if you're allergic to poison ivy, you actually are allergic to certain um, uh, proteins that are expressed in poison ivy. So you might not get a rash the first time, but the second time, and we'll talk about sensitization here in a minute, um, you might. And then like latex gloves, uh, we definitely, I've definitely come across that in manufacturing. A lot of folks have transitioned away from latex um, because not only are people who are putting the gloves on sensitive, but if you're handling product, that latex has proteins in it that can transfer onto product and be a problem. Um, you know, we talk about bee stings. Some people are deathly allergic to bees. That's an injection, so it's going into your skin. And then food allergies, things that you eat, right? Like medication, nuts, shellfish. Um, you know, like I was saying, peanuts are a big uh, cause of food allergens. Um, there's a list of food allergens that the FDA mandates that you, um, you know, as a food manufacturer that you control. Um, but there's really nothing like that for cannabis. And then there's inhalation risks uh, with allergic reactions. That's what my, the majority of my research really focuses on. And um, that's what I think has been a major um, issue when it comes to occupational safety hazards in cannabis, where there's dusts and maybe molds and potentially pollen, but also just aerosolized cannabis dust uh, can contain all sorts of cannabis allergens as well as other potential mold allergens. We've talked, I know, a little bit to Matthew about, um, you know, mites, They're, they can be allergens as well. So, you know, the cannabis itself and then things that live on cannabis can be allergenic. So that's like, whoa, I'm really close. That's like one of the um, slides that really describes, uh, you know, the way the allergies manifest. Um, but it happens in a really, really specific immune response way. So it's kind of called a type one immune response. Um, and it creates this sensitization reaction. So I do have a slide for that too. So wait, before I get going, Going though, I, I don't want to be just like blah blah blah. Any does anybody have any questions or uh, just have any comments about those types of allergic responses? Yeah, well, I'll definitely take a look. And if people do have questions, they should definitely put it in chat. One question okay. that I have though is that, uh, like for example, I think, think about how um, there are some things that I think most people have a response to, kind of predictably. Um, and I guess there might be like a conceptual difference. Maybe there's actually, a, 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 I'd be curious to know more. Like, for example, pretty much most people, if they go, like if they're a kid or something and they like roll around in a bunch of grass, they'll feel itchy mm. afterwards. So what's going on there? Like, is it like, would it be appropriate to say everyone is allergic to that or or most, you know, how would you, or was, is that really an allergy that's special? Does it have to be like, non-typical to be an allergy? How, do, how would people describe that? There are some like really common allergens like pollen. Like, a lot of people are allergic to pollen. Um, grass, that pet dander, those are all really common allergens. Um, so to distinguish that between other forms of like skin irritation, because you can develop other types of irritation towards chemicals, even like eczema and others, those are different types of immune responses um, that can develop over time that kind of take a different immune pathway, but they are, you know, immune in nature. So this allergen sensitization really occurs through a very specific mechanism that recognizes mostly proteins from external sources. So in living, in the living components of all cells, 
and all, all living things on Earth really are made of proteins, lipids, nucleic acids, and carbohydrates. Those are the four building blocks of life. And so proteins make up a big chunk of the building blocks of life. They form scaffolds that our cells can hold structure with. They're the little machines that do all the work in the cell. So they're little enzymes and stuff like that. And they also can be recognized by your immune system. And so it's, it's a very specific mechanism. And by mechanism, I mean it has to go through a very specific pathway in order to be an allergen. And, but there's other types of chemical irritants. There's other types of immune reactions to things that can cause rashes and stuff like that that are separate from allergic responses. So that specific mechanism I do have a slide on, so we can definitely dive into that. So when you, here we go, this is, a, this is another nerd thing. So um, when you first interact with an allergen, right, you've got uh, an allergen crossing some type of mucosal membrane. So that's something that's also common in most allergies. And that's because those, your mucosal membranes are all of the, the barriers of your body, right? That's the barrier for the inside of your body to the outside world. And so you have a lot of immune cells that are trafficking this area and making sure that shit that's not supposed to get in there ain't getting in. And one of the things that really monitors that are these antigen presenting cells. So they gobble up stuff that are coming through they cut it up into little bits and they present it on the outside of their cell. And then there's a bunch of different immune responses that occur once you get this sense, when you basically, your, your, your uh, immune system is recognizing this allergen. You'll get a cascade of different immune responses where B cells will form and they'll mature into plasma cells that produce a very specific antibody called IgE. There's a couple of different types of antibodies, but IgE is the one that really mediates allergic responses and it's found a lot in these muco mucosal membranes. And these will then develop into mast cells or basophils and those just kind of chill out, right? And so that's all fine and good until secondary contact happens. And then you have these mast cells and basophils just chilling by your mucosal membranes, waiting to see that allergen again. As soon as they do, they release all of these granules, which contain histamines, contain like uh, pro-inflammatory molecules. They recruit more immune cells to the area. And basically they go on red alert. And that's, um, that's that is how this sensitization occurs um, in individuals who have allergies. So a lot of times what, when you do like skin prick tests and stuff, you'll look for inflammation as a result of these primed sensitized immune cells that are recognizing that little bit of allergen or you'll do an, a screening for IgE in your blood. And so these will be different ways that you can measure to see if you're actually allergic to something. So that's the actual mechanism for allergic responses. It has to kind of follow that pathway. Now there's other types of um, you know, autoimmune diseases and things that are mediated by slightly different responses that can kind of present as if they're allergies. Usually they don't immediately take place. So that's one of the characteristic hallmarks of an allergic reaction is when you're allergic to something, you're going to know right away. And so that is different than things like eczema, things like more um, long-term immune responses. And um, there are other like parts of your immune system that can recognize bits and pieces of microbes so there's, there's, I mean, you can go down rabbit hole after rabbit hole investigating how our immune uh, system has really um, uh, developed to recognize self from non-self. So like, it's like, this shit ain't me. And I know this because the DNA is different. The proteins are different. It's a certain sugar that I don't produce, but those are not mediated through these IgE immune responses, but you can still get immune responses through different pathways. Did that answer your question? I kind of went on for a while. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it did sort of. I guess what I'm saying is that like, there are some things that like pretty much 100% people are gonna have a reaction to, right? So like, they're not like, 
Like, I wouldn't say that 100% of people got get, like, pollen allergies right. or at the very least they don't get a response that is, like, to a level that is bothersome, right? Because you also can have an immune response reaction or an allergic reaction, right? That is like kind of subdued or it isn't as extreme as for other people because everyone's sure. a little different. But like there, yeah. there are some substances that it's like, uh, I mean, they probably just going, probably people don't like think of them as like an allergy because like everyone is going to have a, 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 a reaction to X, Y, and Z. Although there are some people, for example, who are not allergic to like the poison ivy you were talking about, right? There are some right. people who aren't. Yeah. Right. And even within, like, if you have a peanut allergy, there's like a, I want to say like a dozen or so allergens present within peanuts. And you might be allergic to peanuts and I might be allergic to peanuts, but we're, you, we're allergic to different components of those peanuts. So that, oh, yeah, that, yeah. Al that also may account for different, like, manifestations of allergies, the severity of the reaction. Typically, when people have food allergies, they tend to be allergic to other airborne things a little bit more readily and vice versa. And there's even evidence that, um, you know, if if there's certain allergens present on pollen um, that's also present, let's say, in wheat, when you mm -hmm. eat wheat, then because you've been breathing in a lot of that pollen, you can become sensitized to eating it as well. And so there is some link there between an inhalation uh, exposure and developing of allergens that transfers over into an oral administration of an allergen that's not the same as pollen, but because it has that same bit of protein, it could potentially, and has been shown, that it can um, also like induce a food allergy, which is a bummer. <laughs> it's like a total yeah. bummer. But okay. yeah, I mean, I think like your grass, analogy that could be a couple of different things it could be allergens that are on the grass it could be little cuts that the grass gives you that activates oh, your immune system point. it could be you know a lot of different things but that is a really good point and and most people who sit in grass for a long period of time get itchy ass so i totally get what you're saying <laughs> yeah yeah and I, I always wondered if it was like um because like some grasses like for people who don't know like some of them more, more egregiously than others like um Pampas grass is a good example of this, where like the leaf blades like produce like a silicate like uh, mm -hmm. extrusion that if you were to and it's like it's like in one direction or mostly in one direction. So if you were to like you've had the unfortunate situation of like pulling on the grass blade, uh, Ooh, you will, you will tear and rip into your skin because of these silicate blades essentially. And obviously that's no good. But I was thinking something more like uh, lawn more typical lawn grasses where like I always thought I didn't really know but like maybe they're like spores or something like that where it's like well of course like your body's going to be like well that's not me and have a, a mild very mild reaction in most cases but a reaction nonetheless yeah and I think that that's you know there's there's different ways you can have an irritant you know on your skin it could be physically cutting you or causing tiny little lacerations that's going to recruit your immune cells. It's going to cause inflammation. It's going to, you know, make your immune system mad. Um, there could be chemicals on there that are irritants that are not necessarily allergens, you know, like we were talking about terpenes earlier, or it could be allergens and other things that may activate different pathways in your immune system. So until you really get those skin prick tests or do some IgE blood sampling, Sometimes it's really, that's why allergens, especially like uh, contact, like skin contact allergens, they can be really hard to figure out because you're like, did I change my fabric softener? Like mm -hmm. what's going on here? Like, so, uh, or, it, and you can even have other manifestations. Like if you're stressed, you could, and you had chicken pox as a kid, you could start getting like tiny little, uh, like shingles and stuff like that. So there's all sorts of skin stuff that gets crazy. I really focus on airborne allergens, but, and even food allergens can be really hard to pinpoint as well. So people who struggle with allergies usually struggle with kind of all of the above. Yeah. And since a lot of people work with, um, a lot of people who are following both of us probably are big into plants and growing plants and things like that. I just want to reiterate a point we've made in the last live stream, which is that like, 
one of the cool things about I would say most animals is that uh, we have this like adaptive immune system, right? This the the immune we have specialized cells, immune cells, and different kinds of white blood cells and granulocytes and all this stuff, um, or gr granulocytes, granulosome, granulocyte. Well, yeah, what? they're all yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, and and the um, and, uh, uh, plants don't have this. Plants do not have this at all. They have, but the, but what's kind of cool is that plants have they have just the 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 um, innate immune system, which we also have. It's kind of mm -hmm. like immune system 2.0. Everything mostly has like a 1.0, which is the innate, and then you have that adaptive immune system. That's how I like to characterize it, simplified. But even those cells it's like each cell has to be an immune cell in a little way in a basic way and they take in they have their own receptors and they will have immune responses of course mm -hmm. and uh, the way that you described it um i think very much reminds me of how that works so like if anyone was curious like if a pest is munching on your plants or things like that there's all kinds of things and like the saliva and the uh, the, the waste matter and just on the body of an organism like a, a pathogenic fungus or even a non-pathogenic fungus will still elicit an immune response in the plant because ultimately the plant has to keep things in check, right? And so uh, even a mutualist or something that's a good guy essentially or what we would call a good guy has to be able to bypass the immune system enough to establish but the immune system does, it does actually go, go and check it. Otherwise you'd have sepsis, which is, you know, you'd essentially right. have like the right microbe in the wrong place, which can happen to us, you know, um, in like a traumatic injury or something. Good bacteria, they get into like your bloodstream is a problem and that kind of thing. Absolutely, I mean, and that's, that's really interesting when you, so as a microbiologist, like, I don't know if, if most people who are listening know this, but, Microbiologists and immunologists are like two sides of the same coin. <laughs> so we we always like, you know, microbiologists are always thinking, what are microbes doing to subvert the immune system or get around it or bypass it or hide from it or whatever? And immunologists are always thinking about that entire like cascade of different immune signals and chemokines and cytokines and what's being included and how are these immune cells developing? So like my best friend is an immunologist and I love her. But, like, we just think very differently about this. And that's because there are, they're just two very different, like, sides of the coin, the same coin, which is th these interactions, these host microbe interactions. I don't know too much about how plants do this. I'm much more uh, familiar with humans. Um, but I do know that plants are able to recognize something called pathogen associated. Um, P -A molecular patterns. Molecular patterns, that's yeah. right. And so and so can humans. So yeah. like I was saying, there's like there's bits and pieces of these microbes that will trigger like these toll like receptors or these other um little receptors. And, are, and you got it. And and so that is part of the innate immune system, which can also create like immune responses, maybe not an allergenic response, because again, that has to follow a very specific adaptive immune system response but immunology is nutso butso it's like it reminds me of like uh daytime soap opera where there's like 500 million actors and actresses and they're all like hooking up here and there across the like you don't really? know how they're interacting but they all are at some point and that's that's kind of how it is um but in can cannabis is really no different as far as your immune system is going to recognize certain um proteins as being foreign and you can develop allergies against specific cannabis allergens and so they're and these allergens they're not out there to like do harm right they have other functions they're proteins so they're usually structural they're usually carrying out some type of enzymatic activity but it just so happens that it triggers your immune response it's like that peanut meme that i showed earlier right. um and so and so there's here i'm gonna i'm gonna show you this next slide now okay so okay. Woo, woo. so these are the ones i normally study so i study common arrow allergens so dust mites molds pets pollen these are things that you breathe in um and it causes a bunch of different problems 
uh, to people who are allergic to them. So you can get, you know, chronic rhinitis, which sw uh, swollen sinus, eye inflammation, you can get asthma, it triggers asthma attacks. So these are, um, these are issues that you see with airborne allergens. Um, and a lot of this is actually contained in dust. So dust mites are mostly found in dust. Mold spores can be found in dust. Pet dander, dust, pollen, that's kind of floating around, but you can also find that in dust. And when you look at cannabis allergens, so I'm going to zoom in. There are about four or five different cannabis allergens. They're, they're labeled here as CAN-S3, CAN-S5, CAN-S4, CAN-S2. They have different homologs or orthologs is what you would call it, since they are in different species. What that means is they're proteins. Don't you mean different? Wait, I have a question. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> so um, orthologs, because they're different genes, they do the same thing? So orthologs usually mean that it's a very similar protein found in a different species. Yeah. Homologs oh, okay. yeah. usually mean that there, you can have redundancies. You can have multiple proteins that are found in the genome. Basically, they're coded in the genome in multiple places, but there might okay. be slight little changes in those proteins. So, like, uh, I think THCA synthase, uh, like, there's there's examples in cannabis of homologs that are similar enough, but they are just different enough that they do something slightly different. And so, and so they would that's, be an ortholog. Orthologs are usually in different species. Homologs are usually in the same species. Oh, in the same. I see what you're yeah. saying. Yeah. But okay. they're, they're I almost. Yeah. Yeah. I almost only have a when I think of when I, whenever almost whenever I'm talking about that, I'm thinking about it in like a phylogenetic tree, and when they're like t looking at different genes and going, well, these ones are homologous, so you know they're descended from the yes. same lineage. So they're not the same species in the case, but I get what you're saying, right? Like we're not yeah, talking. It's, I'm yeah, I'm getting into very, very uh, detailed uh, language on this, and honestly, most people don't care. Like an ortholog and a homolog, basically, Who what cares, it means right? is the proteins are really similar. So their amino acid sequences are really similar. Their DNA sequences are really similar. I mean, we've we've heard, you know you and I are 99.9% .9 the same genetic sequence. That's because we code for a lot of the same proteins, right? And those proteins are going to share a lot of the same sequences because if you start changing those sequences, you change the function of the enzyme, and usually that's not good. Right. Usually you're creating a deleterious uh, mutation when something like that happens. But with cannabis, it's a plant, right? There's lots of plants that share many, many of the same genes, and those genes are are very uh, similar in sequence. So like can S5, it shares like, you know, different homology with uh, other plants that we know people develop allergies towards. I had a friend who was allergic to apples. He could eat cooked apples, but he couldn't eat raw apples and his oh. mouth would tingle. It would be crazy. And I was like, that sucks for you because I love apples. But like, also there's these other, um, you know, uh, similar proteins that are found in all sorts of plants, vegetables, fruits, and it makes sense because they're, most of these are structural or they carry out some type of enzymatic activity that all plants need to carry out. I think one of them is like a, a photosynthetic um, protein. It's got a component of photosynthesis. It's like, yeah, that's, that's going to be shared most likely yeah. in a lot of different plants. And so you can develop allergies towards kind of the flavor of this particular cannabis allergen. And if you already have allergies towards other plants and you know like you have, you know, soy allergies um, or uh, nut allergies, there are there is homology between those some of those allergens and the ones that you find in cannabis. And so you can get cross sensitization um, and the more you're exposed to the plant, the more likely that you are going to develop these allergies um, and the context in which you're exposed. So if you're, you know, always breathing in dust, that like your lungs are pretty sensitive to a lot of these things. If you're always like, um, you know, rubbing up against it and you start noticing that you're you're developing an allergy to it, um, that's more of a skin allergy. So this figure here, I, I took from 
this paper, this uh, decupter, that's a cool last name, decupter do right there. <laughs> so occupational allergies to cannabis. So this uh, paper does a good job talking about like these direct exposures. So everything in the green in the middle is like you directly interacting with the plant in its, uh, you know, its growing conditions or in the dry cure stages or even in the end cycle. Like, honestly, I'm going to switch back. A lot of research that's been done on this hasn't been done on cannabis workers. It's been done on law enforcement and like forensic scientists who've been handling these materials. And, you know, because they handle it, they develop these allergies and then people care because they're, you know, law enforcement and stuff. But in cannabis, like, it's not for some reason. And I, I've had employees who've had cannabis uh, allergies, and it's not taken as seriously, I think, as it should be. Mm -hmm. um, so so this, this uh, little circle of occupational allergies also shows other things in yellow that can kind of exacerbate or promote cannabis sensitization. So, um, for example, if you have really bad air quality in your indoor work environment and you're working with a lot of cannabis dust or you don't have, you know, the right um, engineering controls to have good filtration and air abatement when you're grinding or you don't have a um, respirator program, your work environment is not going to protect you from that exposure. Uh, molds and bacteria can definitely sensitize you. They can act as something called adjuvant, which will enhance your immune response. Like we were talking about, endotoxin is a big one that's recognized by your immune system. It's a, it is a pathogen-associated um, molecular pattern. And your immune system, when it sees endotoxin, that is from gram-negative bacteria. When your immune system sees that, it goes ape shit. And so if you're seeing, if your immune system sees this, Plus, then it sees, you know, cannabis at the same time, it can actually enhance that reaction. Same with molds and bacteria. Um, pesticides and other chemicals can actually enhance certain immune responses. And they also listed THC. I haven't seen a lot of research on that. I think THC can, uh, since it's an immune repressor, it could probably suppress some of these responses. And then your host factors. So everyone kind of has their own. Um, sensitization risks that um, their genes are just going to predispose an environment, you know, nature versus nurture. Some people are just going to be more sensitive. So I really like this because it does show all of the different contributors that we know of that can potentially um, both sensitize you directly and indirectly enhance that sensitization. So if you're working in a dirty grow, that has a lot of mold, has a lot of bacteria, doesn't have good air quality, it's probably going to be more likely that you're going to develop allergies against cannabis because you're getting all these other signals from your environment like and your immune system's on high alert. And does your body learn to associate different things together? So these, like I was saying, the immune learn. system, it has learn. all this process. You know I mean. Yeah. Yeah. It has all this crosstalk. So if one branch of the immune system gets activated, it's going to recruit and upregulate other parts of your immune system as well. It's kind of like oh, the military. No. What I mean, right? is, oh, what I, sorry, what I mean is like, I mean like to associate. I mean like if you, if you, uh, um, if you're exposed to something that causes an allergic reaction and it's under a context where you also have other things happening at the same time, can the uh, can the other thing then cause an allergic reaction, or is there like an association component that can kind of um, occur? Do you know what I mean? Like yes. like that. Yeah. So that is cross sensitization. Oh, okay. and yes, it totally okay. can happen. Yeah. So you can get if even when other things are around that aren't a problem necessarily, you can develop uh, allergies against other antigens that are present that you weren't allergic to before and that wasn't your primary antigen that was becoming it so an antigen is just another way of saying a part of a protein an allergen is that part of a protein that your body now recognizes as foreign it is mounting an immune response towards but antigen and allergen are often interchanged with the word allergen really having that allergic response component to it so some antigens might not become allergens 
But when you are um, exposed to certain types of antigens, if other antigens are around, they could be kind of, you know, pulled up in this immune response and you could get cross sensitization. Is sure. that part, is that because, and this is kind of a, another sort of in the weeds question, but that's because of like your, your memory cells, right? Because they're remembering both of those happening at the same time. Am I correct there? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So a lot of you, yeah, you're spot on. So these B cells, once they recognize, and so what's really cool is, you know, we all say like every, every cell in your body uh, has the same DNA, right? Except for maybe your, your eggs and sperm, right? Because they're going through meiosis. But your immune system, specifically your adaptive immune system, is an exception to that rule. So your immune cells are, especially your T cells and your B cells, are constantly rearranging their DNA to change the little bits that they're recognizing at the end of those, yeah. of those yeah. little um, antibodies, right? And so they're going through all this chromosomal rearrangement all the freaking time. Like, I need to make sure I'm ready for this theoretical antigen that I haven't seen. I need to make sure I'm ready for this I haven't seen. And so they're constantly creating all these different versions. It's only when you get that reaction where that, that antigen will bind because it, it recognizes a very small amino acid sequence. It's like four to 12 amino acids. And so if it binds then, it's like boop, 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 and it like sends this signal through the cell that goes through all these pro all these maturation processes like you're talking about, and it um, ends up creating these memory cells. But the right sequence of events has have to happen in order for those memory cells to be created. And exactly like you're saying, maybe you just didn't have immune cells that were present that had that certain permutation that would recognize it. Maybe you did. Um, but if they're both, if one is present, you might, it might get caught up in kind of that uh, storm, that cascade of, of immune responses, and you might end up getting um, cross sensitization there. That's, uh, that's helpful to get that re-emphasized. Yeah, because uh, some, some of those technical parts I'm a little fuzzy on, but I think even if it is a little technical, it's nice, it's interesting, I think it's still simple enough people get that. Um, and essentially, I mean, like, because it's it, up is crazy. It's crazy. It is, I'm right. telling you, like, it, it's just, it, it literally is a soap opera. There's so many players. They're all doing so many things. They're talking to each other. They're collaborating. They're conspiring. There's different branches. And it's just, yeah, it's a lot. Like, I've taken immunology and I work with, as, you know, working with immune responses through allergens. And I'm still just like, flabbergasted all the time by stuff I learned about the immune system because it's it's there's a lot there's a lot there so so yeah I mean I think that um, as far as cannabis sensitization goes you know from an occupational safety perspective it's really important um, that especially if you're working with with fine dust so there's another element here yeah. when you're breathing this in right so most particles so when we're talking about like aerosols and bioaerosols, which is something that my lab uh, really focuses on, if it's a particle that's below two and a half micrometers, which is like, I want to say like 30 times the width of a human hair, it's 30 times smaller. Um, it's really small. Like when, when they're talking about the uh, wildfires out on the East Coast, they were talking about PM 2.5 and small. Yeah, when I was in... When I was in China, uh, I remember my first time going to Beijing. It was like the worst air quality had that the that the U.S. consulate was able to was able to uh, record. Obviously, the official right. records were different, but the ones at the consulate were uh, probably true. And they were wor the worst that they had recorded. And I don't remember the number exactly. I bet if I dug in, I could find out. But uh, yeah, they they had that same kind of um, terminology. It was like it was like yeah. big. It was like I want to say it was like, could it have been like 200 or 250 or is that way too big? No, I mean, those are big particles, but big particles. Um, they then, they'll, big. then they'll do counts per like cubic meter. And then that's what they'll, they'll bin it into different sizes. So it'll be like okay. 2.5 and smaller between 2.5 and five, between five and 10 and then above 10. So, and then they'll count the particles and they'll assign a number per cubic meter um, or, or a liter, it kind of depends but they'll assign a number of particle counts in that size range uh, for a 
certain period of time. They'll also measure volatiles and stuff. And I definitely hear you. When I went to China, I was like, you can't see the sun here. It's just a fuzzy disk in the sky. <laughs> That's just the power of Chinese industry, okay? Yeah. I'm not going to hear any sort of uh, unpatriotic stuff. <laughs> Your social credit score will go down as a result. No, I remember going to Tiananmen Square and having the same experience. What was really kind of uh, uncanny about the whole experience was that, like you just said, I was there, I looked up in the sky, and it was winter time, so I'm going to give them a bit of a break. In northern China, yeah, it does get cold and stuff, so, you know. But um, uh, at Tiananmen, they have, the, uh, they have like a, a video projection you know, um, screen. And it's like very high, you know, super high quality, very bright, very light. And you've got like these like, um, just like very blue, clear sky video of like the rest of the air. You know what I mean? Like just something that looks very cool to watch. Oh right? yeah, they or, totally super impo impose a blue yeah. sky on all their pictures. It's like, yeah. that's not the sky I saw when I was in China. No, yeah. I, I feel like you could have made a funny little image uh, and then maybe, you know, maybe that doesn't uh, get to everyone. But the thing is, is that that was so funny to me and, and a very um, sort of indicative of the situation. So, yeah. Absolutely. And that's that's all because of particulate matter in the air. And like you were saying, it's industrialization, you know, fires. You can get particulate matter when you are, um, you know, in your in the garden at work and you're, you know, filling uh you know filling pots with cocoa you can get pm in the air and even grinding cannabis milling cannabis um is going to create small particles if you have a good mill and you have good air abatement you know uh hopefully you don't have to wear a respirator but you should really have a risk assessment come in by like an industrial hygienist or somebody who understands air quality and make sure that uh, those proper engineering controls are in place first. And engineering controls are, how are you controlling it closest to the source as possible? While a mask or a respirator is like the last line of defense that right. you have as a worker yeah. against these particles. And, you know, particulate matter just in general is not really that great to inhale, especially the smaller it is, below 2.5. Basically, that PM kind of, it goes into your lungs, it's able, most, most bigger stuff gets caught in the back of your throat, gets caught in your trachea, gets caught in the bronchioles, the branches of your lung. But uh, PM is 2.5 and smaller, goes right into alveoli, those little sacs at the end of your lung uh, branches that exchange air. Um, and it can basically be absorbed right into your blood. And so those small PM, those small particulate matters are, uh, particles are, are really harmful for the sheer fact that they can get through a lot of stuff and go right into your blood. So that in and of itself is a challenge that, um, you know, as an operator, you know, you wanna make sure that you are protecting yourself, but really as a manufacturer, it's your responsibility to protect your employees. And then um, on top of that, in that, PM, in that particulate matter, PM and air quality, it's so funny, I was talking to my boss, uh, the other day and I was talking about PM and cannabis and he's like, wait, 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 are we talking about powdery mildew or are we talking yeah. about particulate matter? I almost <laughs> no. interrupted you to, to make that clarification, <laughs> but I think you said particulate matter enough that I hope somebody following along will follow that too. Yes, but yeah, we mean matter. particulate yeah. matter. Yeah. PM yeah. in the context uh, of particulate matter. Yes. Yeah, so, no, no. Oh, you can keep going. Oh, okay. Um. So... So when you have this particulate matter that's really fine and also contains allergens from the sure. cannabis plant itself or potentially from the molds growing on it, like if you're trimming off moldy bud and it's generating little bio aerosols and then you're breathing it in, or, um, you know, there's also evidence that mites, um, you know, in, in your house, you have dust mites they're one of the top allergens that you find indoors. And when you breathe them in, you have all sorts of issues. You're basically breathing in their poop. Oh, and that's what really, yeah. that's what has all the allergens in it. It does, they, they do have allergens on their like 
on their on their uh you know exoskeletons but their poop is really allergenic and that's what you're breathing in same with uh mites in agricultural settings so there's spider mites which which people who work in in parallel industries can develop allergies to and then some of the um predatory mites you can develop allergies to as well and so yeah. there's there's a lot of different things time. yeah so there's a lot of different things especially when you're grinding it or trimming it or doing anything to agitate it so now your little particles are getting in the air now you're breathing that in and if it's small enough especially if it's small enough it's going to be a problem now here's another question like um and actually there's a few questions in the comments i'm just going to reiterate to people that if you do have questions i will get to them and it'll probably be after the answer to this one but like this is a big one because if we're talking about allergens and we're talking about cannabis and the way that most people consume cannabis is how smoking <laughs> how yes how bad is that for you and how do you how do you delineate these of course yeah. i'm asking the big question i think is on most people at least that's on my yeah. mind whenever we talk about sure. this of course so well, i mean th this is a great question and you know anytime you are combusting organic matter you're creating uh pyrolysis compounds things pyro fire olysis lysis you're breaking down you know those molecules those components of that organic matter and you're turning it into other stuff right so and some of that stuff can be harmful um so just that sheer act of burning like if you see if you work in a fire pit you know if you're a pit boss your whole life you're gonna probably end up having lung issues because you've oh, been yeah. breathing that um you know if you there's even cautions like like different states will put out cautions not to burn moldy firewood because moldy firewood those microbes can aerosolize and you can breathe them in and that's exactly what happens you know when you combust or vaporize plant matter so you're not necessarily killing those microorganisms but you're really just generating bio aerosols that contain living microorganisms and their non-living bioactive components so kind of separating that out from the combustion products which are going to probably have a harm as well these bioactive agents can be harmful and it's been shown in tobacco that they contribute to the inflammation that you see uh, with copd and chronic bronchitis uh, and emphysema um, these like agents like endotoxin we were talking about that lps ergosterol which is um, a fungal membrane component found in all fungi pretty much and then you have allergens which could also play a role in that so if you're allergic you know a lot of people who are allergic to cannabis aren't allergic to smoking it so maybe some of that does get denatured and your immune system can't mm -hmm. recognize it but some of these other elements are definitely right like lps is definitely or endotoxin is definitely recognized by your immune system so i think that it definitely plays a role and what we've seen so actually dr mark hernandez the uh, primary investigator that i work with at cu boulder he's done research um basically showing that uh diesel exhaust by itself can be harmful but mm -hmm. uh and then molds and other uh other allergens and and bioactive components of microbes that are aerosolized can be harmful but when you combine them together they become synergistic yeah. and so it exacerbates okay. the, the problem and so yes you have your chemical risks for you know burning organic matter but then you have your biological risks uh from generating bio aerosols when you smoke or vaporize and even vaporizing like i prefer vaporizing because i feel like it's a lot less harsh i can taste the terps a little bit better but there was a study that came out by the FDA at the end of last year that basically showed vaporizing does nothing to kill microbes. So I think I saw that. Yeah. I think you might have even shared it and that's how I was exposed to it. Yeah, that was pretty crazy. And that's, you know, if you're consuming product that um, you trust, you know, I grow my own and I've tested it in, in my own lab in my kitchen <laughs> and i know it has low bio burdens but that's another reason why i think not only is it important to test for pathogens that are risks when you breed them in 
but also it's important to test for these biological agents that can be harmful when you breed them in, like allergens um, and and ergosterol, LPS, stuff like that. And so that is, is something that not much research is being done on. A little bit's been done in cannabis, more has been done in tobacco, and it was released in this big Freedom of Information Act. Um, but we've known since the 60s that when you smoke tobacco, you don't kill the microbes, you just generate bioaerosols. So uh, it's one of those things that I don't think we completely understand the risks, but we do know that smoking tobacco is the number one cause of preventable death in the United States. And there's really not a lot of uh, control on microbial contamination in tobacco. Um, And and in cannabis, we allow remediation, which is taking a heavily bioburdened product and zapping the shit out of it with something, ozone, uh, x-ray, radio frequency. And it passes because things aren't alive on there anymore, but all the dead skeletons that contain these bioactive agents are still there. So I think that they still pose a risk. And based on the research that's been done in in tobacco and on viable stuff in cannabis, uh, I think that it can pose a problem. So just trust what you're smoking. Um, And if you do have allergies or you have had respiratory issues, maybe try edibles because your lungs are, you only got one set and you really don't want to fuck them up because they're pretty important. Um, So most of the time I- it's really hard to get a transplant in general and also if you're a smoker. Yeah, it's oh, really you know, tough. Find out. There's not much you can do when you fuck up your lungs. So, um, yeah, so treat your lungs with care. Um, I also know if I do smoke a joint, I know it's like kind of hoity-toity and I'm sure there'll be haters on here, but I'll put a filter mm-hmm. on. And so okay. when I roll, I, put, I don't just use a crutch. I put a, a straight up filter on there. Um, and yeah, and when I vaporize, as the yeah, cigarette yeah, right. companies might call it, or something like that, right? There's like all, all this crazy marketing that's done with cigarettes right. that's just so uh, unethical and wrong. But yes. it is what it is. All that, of those words. That we don't want to be tobacco. That's my biggest thing. No, is like, cannabis should be better than tobacco. Like we should not. Be like, hey, well, the bar we set is tobacco, so we can totally meet that and exceed it. I'm like, no, tobacco should not be the bar that we set. We should be setting it like up with fruits and veggies and other herbal uh, products and stuff like that. So, yeah, don't smoke moldy stuff or stuff you don't trust or stuff that's been remediated. There was an, uh, I shared it a while ago on my channel for anyone who wants to look through my IGTVs and find it, but there was a professor from MIT, the name of which uh, escapes me, but the gentleman was talking about, I was, I happened to be watching um, oh, this like MIT lecture, right, about, uh, I think it was about radiation, actually, uh, was like the actual uh, uh, main topic, but I clipped a, a section of it where they're talking about um, how people get exposed to radiation, uh, and one of the, or, or radioactive compounds, or or whatever you know, radioactive materials. And one of the ways, especially things like radon and um, a few other derivatives, is through smoking. It's because and specifically mm. they were talking about tobacco, uh, and and I know this specifically because they said it, and also because I don't know how relevant this is to cannabis, but I think it still is rather rel- relevant to probably anything that you're smoking that's like botanical material. Because uh, he specifically mentioned like the broad leaves. So you're taking all this surface area. So there's, oh, there's all, all kinds of these particles around anyways. You kick it up in the dust. If right. you go to Chernobyl, there's a whole lot more radioactive dust, right? <laughs> um, I watched this uh, incredibly like um, just like disgustingly scary video. Uh, I don't know any other word to use. It's a weird way to say it, but of these people scuba diving or attempting to scuba dive in the Chernobyl exclusion zone where the where the reactor is which is regular scuba equipment you know what i'm saying so um that was bad right That's obviously crazy. and like there's a section where like they one of them like taps like a, a ventilation shaft and all of this dust falls off and another person says you've taken off 15 years of our life or something like that and that's no joke but long story, but that's that's an extreme example. Um, 
so people get exposed to this on like a very small level. But one thing that will change that uh, ratio is the the collection of this stuff onto plant material or into plant material gets taken up, and then you concentrate it by drying them into like he he put it like little sticks of 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 um, dried plant material. So it's super concentrated, and then you um, inhale it essentially right through the burning process. And um, you know that just kind of made me go you know like wow so that's so all those things you just mentioned and then there's like that how much of that i'm not trying to fear monger but like that's just another point i guess i wanted to make like you don't see it you don't think about it but it is happening it is happening to you without you realizing it and i think that's what this kind of information is so cool to me about uh i mean if you're going to put a nice positive spin on it it's that like you're at least being informed about the things that can affect you and mitigating that to some degree doesn't mean that you're going to live to 220 if you just get like no radioactive particles but you know anything that could help you get to like 80 is a good thing in my mind <laughs> um and i uh i'll let you respond to that but i'm going to go look for uh questions in the chat so okay. um so if you have questions people put them on there and um i don't think i'll want to go too much longer i didn't want to make this super burdensome or anything so maybe for the next 20 minutes we'll just talk about riff about whatever so if you have questions in the comments give them to me otherwise what do you think about that test oh i mean radiation is another uh issue and like you said when you're concentrating concentrating it into something that you're directly consuming it's a little different you know i've seen that argument too with aspergillus like oh well during the day, we we can we breathe in like we breathe in thousands of spores. Two, it's yeah. no problem. Like with yeah. Aspergillus fumigatus, there's there are some publications out there, and that's the worst one. That's the one I work with uh, up at CU Boulder. Um, that you know, throughout the course of the day, you will probably breathe in a hundred to two hundred spores of Aspergillus. That's pretty fumigatus. small. That's pretty it's not that much small, in my opinion yeah. yeah it's not that much compared to other stuff i just in my opinion i mean you're the expert who would know but like i was expecting you to put one or maybe two other zeros on there yeah and so it's really not that much like out in the regular world you know you can find them in a lot of indoor environments that's one thing we really focus on is indoor allergens indoor pathogens that because you know sick building syndrome a lot of people probably have heard of it that way if you have you know, mold in your building or mold in your HVAC, um, you can get a much higher level of these different organisms. But, you know, when you concentrate it into a gram that you're smoking versus over the course of the day, you know, breathing in dozens of cubic yeah. meters air, it's pretty different. And I was actually, I was going to do a little thought experiment the other day, but I got distracted with something else to like calculate, okay, if I consumed 200 spores of Aspergillus fumigatus throughout the course of a day, and that's however many liters or cubic meters of air, because there's a thousand liters in a cubic meter, um, how many joints would that, like, how, how many okay. days of yes. breathing would that be equivalent to a joint that tested positive for Aspergillus? And I think it is like you're basically consuming, and the thing is, too, is it's not quantitative. So you don't know when you test positive for Aspergillus if you failed for 100 spores or 100,000 spores, right. you don't know. And most spores aren't viable. So you might pass your TYM counts, your total use and mold counts, and because less than 1% of spores will actually grow into a CFU. So you might pass TYM um, or you know be right at the level of passing, but you're gonna have a hundred times more of those spores probably present on your product than what actually grows. So yeah. it, it's one of those things where you're concentrating it, right? And so that's the issue. And we don't really understand that well the risk that these microbes pose. And so I still think we should test for aspergillus, but I do think that there's other until, and I think I've, I've, I'm going to get on this hill real quick. And, and sure. I, I know it's on. a big hill. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. I just want a, a, a small point of re-emphasis, yeah. right? What you were saying is like, yeah, I saw that. You might have even see my response. Uh, that uh, somebody, you know, somebody was trying to like make this like, in my opinion, totally false equivalence, like you just said, like, oh, we just breathe it in, it's no problem. But I'm like, if you're sucking down a spore stick, like, I'll just be <laughs> honest. 
I mean, like I, my, one of my favorite ways to consume is, is, a, is a joint too. So I'm not trying to be a hypocrite here. Right. But like, you gotta be intellectually honest. And you also, like you said, you know, you, you want to be able to trust if you home grew it and you're pretty sure it's, it's, it's good and, and all that stuff, that's fine. You might still not actually know, but like, certainly don't be, uh, you know, don't try to say that that like it's not the same thing obviously just breathing in air and also breathe, breathing in indoor air quality is something that's totally slept on super underappreciated but you know going yeah. outside and breathing in spores even if you're not immunocompromised does expose you to things and doing that over 10 years 20 years 50 sure. years of your life that's good you are changing yourself and then that's going to change over time and if you condense that all into a joint and uh maybe it's an old joint or whatever who knows and like uh especially some of these pre-rolls out there and you and you smoke it like ten thousand plus in like one hit is not the same as getting 200 spores over the course of a 24-hour period of time right right Right. and you know there's there's lots of microbes that are out in the environment that that in an environmental exposure may not be harmful but then when they're concentrated in your food product you don't want them there like listeria monosome Mm-hmm. or yeah. like you know staphylococcus aureus that's the microbe i study for my phd 30 percent of your skin people, right it's on your skin it's in your nose yeah. it's in your nasal passages it's in like 30 percent of, of people at any given time are carrying it in their nares but do you want it in your food no so it's like kind of that same concept so um yeah so that's that's another thing is like this is getting into just a lot that we don't know as far as inhalation risks when it comes to cannabis um, and tobacco, because tobacco is not studied very well either. And then occupational inhalation risks, which we actually have some data from, from other parallel agricultural industries. You know, bread makers lung is a thing. Um, that's from, you know, working with, uh, with wheat and rye and all these plant potentially plant allergens, but also the molds that grow uh, uh, in those environments or the spores that are found, you know, these storage spores and stuff like that. And so, and those can exacerbate just like these other occupational allergies in cannabis. And so um, we know that even people who make um, fermented foods, if they're using aspergillus species to make fermented foods, you can develop sensitization to those aspergillus species making cheeses people make like use penicillium species to make cheeses they might not necessarily infect you but you can develop allergies and to the point where you could go into anaphylactic shock and die and so again that this whole debate between living microbes and their bioactive agents and you know these bio burden counts like i really think we should look at all of it because we know in occupational settings that the microbes don't have to infect you to hurt you. And we know that the lungs are very different than your stomach and your intestines, right? Yeah. So the route of administration matters too. So, um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. No, you're totally right. And there's so much more I would say before, but I did promise questions answered. So if they have questions, you know, good. And if I'm, and if you don't have any yet, or if you put some in there while I'm talking, good for you. But the first question I think we got, or at least that I saw, was uh, from er- way earlier in the chat, which is um, from Karmagrapher. They asked, what does uh, something like regalia elicit as far as immune responses? This is a product that's applied for plants, and uh, mm-hmm. its, claim, its claim to fame is that it elicits an immune response in the plant, so it's kind of like a bio-priming agent. And I'm sorry to say that uh, if they have been waiting for this answer, I don't remember off the top of my head, but it's definitely like an... Like a like an ISR response or something like that, some sort of induced systemic response. Mm-hmm. But I'm forgetting. But I'm forgetting what the pathways is are it exactly. A, is it a beneficial? No, no, no. It's like it a. Before. It's like an. It's like an extract. Um, mm. I believe there's like a compound. Actually, I'll just look it up for you right here. The regalia. Regalia. I know, right? What a great name, regalia. Active ingredient. Or it might have been from, yeah, yeah for giant so knotweed. Let's, I always, I always get that um, mixed up with uh, other stuff. So it's a biofungicide, foliar, active ingredient. So it must be from a plant. It's from root. Is it? It must it's be from, from knotweed. 
Which is invasive. So the more Japanese knot or giant knotweed, I should say, that we uh, that we destroy or that we uh, we call, um, I would say the better. <laughs> this benefits so is this us. like an like an essential oil or like a, an extraction product from this plant? Because that could be. Yeah, and so I then mean, it, like... it elicits an immune response in the plant that you sprayed on, essentially. Okay. See, I don't know enough about it to make uh, an informed response but i know that a lot of these oils like essential oils like neem oil um you know I i've used that on my fruits and vegetables in my backyard but do i want to breathe that in i don't yeah. know i don't think so eating it is one thing again these are the other risks um but as far as like how they work and how they might uh irritate you you know these it's well established that like terpenes for example irritate you your lungs which is why when you're formulating vapes you should probably not go above like three percent uh by volume yeah because you start yeah. going higher yeah. than that and uh you're gonna just cough the shit up uh, on <laughs> on those vapes I mean, because they're irritating yeah i mean I, i'm reminded of like I remember my exposure to like baijiu in China, which is the the white wine, but it's like really it's like kerosene. It's like you know, it's like it's like a hundred percent alcohol probably. It's like something you'd use like to put in a lamp, some, you know, and like other, burn it. Like, uh, yeah, it's probably got some other um, alcohols in there too that probably aren't so good for no. you. <laughs> yeah, but it remind, but like that's the thing where like I'm reminded of like how in like especially in the U.S. and probably all, also other places like there's b big regulations like when you buy a certain kind of alcohol or these ones that are regulated as such, it's like it will have this much of this kind of thing in it, or it has to be made this much from this botanical, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, these botanicals, and there's regulations so that you have. You have you're guaranteed a certain amount of whatever those compounds are and usually because it's quality control and you want to like taste the you, so that, and also you don't want to call it something that it isn't so to speak but with regards to regalia to answer that question i'm not sure what the specific response it has in the plants but it is used for for fungi uh, for pathogenic fungi for immune response to them so i assume that the compounds in regalia are triggering uh these sort of generalized perhaps homologous uh you know genes that are it's shared in many different plants that have a similar response to uh this compound and perhaps have a similar sort of antifungal response a lot of these responses just like in people can be very narrow and they can be very short or they can be very broad and they can last like hours or days or longer or they might have other effects that just end up affecting the plant for the for the rest of its life essentially even if it's like somewhat minimally so so that's an interesting thing to consider. But let's see. Any other questions? That was a good question. I, I don't have a good answer for that one. Yeah. But I, I like your answer. I think that was more, more of a, uh, to be honest, I think that was more of a, a Matt question uh, in that context because they're probably <laughs> just like, oh, I know, you know, immune response. You know, I have this regalia. Um, California Craft Trees asks, can you boil mold spores out of cannabis when making an infused tea or tisane? I suppose. Mm. Yeah, so actually it's kind of funny because um, there's like different bio burden allowances in when you're like talking about spices and herbal products for food. You, if you are going to boil it, you can have a little bit more microbes on there before you boil it than if you weren't going to boil it. So um, that's that's a good question. Uh, spores are pretty resistant to a lot of environmental challenges. Now, when you have spores, you're also going to have mycelium. So mycelium is like the actual growing vegetative state of the mold. And then it also produces spores uh, as for most, right. most of them are asexual, but there are some sexual weirdos out there. But uh, <laughs> so you have the mycelium, that's a lot easier to kill. Um, but the spores are really resistant. They have there's all sorts of things that make them environmentally tolerant and make them uh, able to uh, hide from your immune system. And not all so you here are going to have the same kind of resilience. Different spores will be different in that way. I just want to true. bring that point up for people. Like uh, I think like yeah, like some of these mold spores, like aspergillus, I think are a lot more resilient than like powdery mildew, for example. 
Yeah, so aspergillus and penicillium are like considered microspores because they're smaller than a lot of other fungal spores. Um, and they all look the same under a microscope. You can't distinguish them from each other. So they're always just like lumped together, uh, penicillium and aspergillus species. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that if you are going to be cooking with cannabis, it's a lot less of a risk. Plus, you're, you're going to be drinking it or eating it. So typically, um, like in food, you know, aspergillus is not usually tested for directly. They'll test for its byproducts like toxins. Okay, yeah. So um, the toxins can be harmful at high levels when you eat them. But the microorganisms themselves when you eat them are not as harmful. It's more of a quality issue and not so much of a consumer safety issue, which I can definitely go down that path, but I don't think anyone cares about that. But um, so, you know, I still would not boil moldy weed, but if there's weed that you're like, like if there's visible mold on there, yeah. you're getting into the millions of CFU and you probably, you don't want anything to do with that. And it's a, it's a porous uh, substance, you know, so unlike cheeses, which are hard cheeses, like you can sometimes cut off the moldy parts of a hard cheese and maybe the mycelium didn't go through the rest sure. of it. But yeah. for, for porous stuff like bread and flour, if you see mold on there, it's probably throughout the entire batch. It's just concentrated so you can see it. So don't do that with moldy stuff. But if you have stuff that is a little older and you you trust it but don't quite trust it enough to smoke it, yeah, make some make some tinctures out of it, make some butter out of it, you know, make some edibles, whatever, firecracker that shit, whatever you want to do. But <laughs> but if it's visibly moldy, don't eat it. You think alcohol would kill them? Alcohol is actually not very good at killing spores. So right. that's one of the other People have asked me that question with tinctures. So that's why yeah. I asked, yeah. So it would be more the heating, I think, that would help if you were going to heat a tincture. You know, it's always good to decarb first. So that decarb process will probably do a good job of killing a lot of stuff. Um, but, yeah, alcohol itself, like, if especially if you're using, like, 70% alcohol to clean surfaces, either isopropanol or ethanol, um, those are those work through dehydrating, basically flipping the membranes of cells inside out. And when you're a spore, your membranes are protected inside yeah. your spore case. Yeah. And so yeah. they're not very good at killing spores. Uh, so they're not sporicidal when you're talking about surface disinfection. But for tinctures, I mean, I would decarb first, and that will do a good job killing things, and then heat during your uh, tincture making process. Snarny Poo asks, so dabbing hash rosin would be the best. Uh, this was also early earlier in the conversation so i assume we were talking about like the better ways to consume but i don't think that's necessarily the case yeah in fact it's a con concentrate right yeah so right. and it depends is it is it bubble hash did it go through like a butane extraction or did right. it go through just a regular you knocked off those trichomes and collected them and pressed them so that in that case there was no organic solvent i'm oh, sorry my phone keeps moving uh, there was no, like, solvent there that we know was probably, I mean, although I haven't seen a lot of uh, data really supporting this, but it's kind of common sense that these solvents will kill a lot of the microbes that are on there, especially at high pressures and, you know, uh, high temperatures, which a lot of distillation and stuff like that will go through. But um, if you're, you know, using bubble hash, uh nothing happened except for water was used to like knock those off and press it pressing is gonna add some heat so that might help um but like you were saying it's kind of like concentrating so if there are toxins there if there are other fat soluble um bioactive agents like lipopolysaccharide or lps or endotoxin or ergosterol those could potentially concentrate in those concentrates. So you don't want, you want your starting material to still be high quality and not have heavy bio burdens and not have issues with, you know, molds and bacteria and stuff. Um, and, and then making sure you start with a good product, then yeah, I think you could, um, you know, have, have a cleaner smoke, but there's, there's also evidence out there that oxidation happens on those concentrates and it can create these different adducts. Um, I was reading a paper about it 
uh, that my actually my lung immunologist friend sent me. And she's like, check out this shit. And it was about, it wasn't dabbing. I think it was distillate. Um, oh. But yeah, but there are other things we just don't understand about that route and that particular concentrate either. But, you know, maybe it's better. Maybe it's not. I don't know for sure. That's my answer. Yeah. <laughs> question i mean good answer and good question you know like and just put it in context like uh you know, not to be a downer but um even the oxygen you breathe is not great like not great for you obviously you need to survive but like oxygen is a, you know creates free radicals and that's why your body pretty much everything that breathes oxygen and even things that don't um have had to deal with this and actually like cellular life predates an oxygen atmosphere environment yes. so yes. like there are there's parts of our cells if you go back far enough along that are still with us that you know you can take the microbe out of the anaerobic environment but you can't take the anaerobic uh mechanisms out of the microbe sure. as easily i guess the revolution as possible but yeah like so yep. the reason i bring this up because um, you know, many organisms have made it, uh, have done very well for themselves in being able to repair these problems or use, use and acquire antioxidants to do that or produce antioxidants to do that and all that kind of stuff. But like, I bring this up because like, it's all a cost benefit analysis mm -hmm. at the end of the day that you, you had to be personally responsible for, I think. Um, obviously, that doesn't mean that we can't hold like companies, and organizations, you know, to a safety standard, but if you're more informed, I think you can make a better decision. And I think that's always a good thing. But like to keep it in context, like it's not like you're going to like live for a millennium because you didn't smoke or did smoke or, you know, <laughs> live like bubble boy in an oxygen <laughs> tank or something. You know what I mean? So like you got to got to consider the, the real context of things, I guess, <laughs> not absolutely. to be. Macabre. Yeah, absolutely. It's all about risk assessment. And um you got to be realistic about what we know and what we don't know. And I think everyone can agree that if you grow under good sanitary conditions, under a controlled environment, you have good airflow and circulation and air quality and water quality and your substrate's good and you dry cure properly, you shouldn't have micro issues. And you're going to minimize those risks and maximize the quality of your product. And, um, you know, then people will feel comfortable with the flour that they get from you because they know that it's produced under good conditions and it's high quality. And quality means a lot of different things to different people. Yeah, that's for sure. But, sure. yeah, I know. We saw, I saw that comment of yours on. on <laughs> what does quality mean? Define please? quality, please. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's a thing that people say all the time. Mean. It's a buzzword, for sure. For sure. Like yeah, you pointed it's totally out. Yeah, totally it can't, they, but you know, it is if it's, it's not all, defined. It is if it's not defined, I should say. It is, yeah. And then, then there's consumer safety. So there's quality aspects and then there's consumer safety aspects. And consumer safety is really what are the inhalation risks or the um, ingestion risks of eating or breathing this in? And we have to go off what we know and what, and you proactively identify those risks and try to put in prevention before they become a problem. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's just the, that's really the heart of the issue and trusting where you get your cannabis from. I mean, I grow at home, so that's, I trust what I do in my backyard and I don't do anything fancy, you know, mm -hmm. I, and I don't dry cure in a HEPA filtered environment. Like right. it's in my garage. <laughs> You yeah, know? so like I don't I don't like that it sucks that people get this impression that like because you work in the in the field that you do that you're some sort of like um like climate controlled zealot when you're not you're not some sort of overly zealous person you know you you're growing like maybe 95% of home growers are growing and you know you're not like going through an extra special process and you feel pretty comfortable with that and so I think that's you know I think that uh you know we should lead with that you know like you know perhaps people will be a little bit more disarmed i want to get through these um a little bit nine of five growers said um that at work when it rains it trips the contamination monitors because of radon that's interesting that's oh, not really dude. a question of course but i wanted to highlight that because that's interesting um radon yeah. it trips it well it must be from the soils then that it's kicked, that the rain's kicking up right? 
Yeah. Yeah. But there's also other things that can. So I, I just got back from this conference um, th where people are studying the aerobiome out in fields, like microbes seed clouds. They do all this crazy shit. It's really, really freaking cool. But one of the things that they were talking about is the electricity that's generated um, during a thunderstorm will actually break pollen yeah. into tiny little <laughs> pieces. And it, you know, it turns it into hundreds of little fragments that are much, much smaller can go deeper down into your lungs. And so like right at the beginning and during thunderstorms, people will have more asthma attacks and allergy, allergic responses. Uh, and they think it's because they're break, like the electrical um, currents in mm -hmm. the air are literally busting pollen open. And they had all this cool scanning electron microscopy photos of like busted open pollen and stuff i was like this is so cool <laughs> that, yeah that's that's really fascinating i um you know it's like it's one of those things that's like me not first of all it's not intuitive unless you have a bunch of like scientific knowledge about the environment um and, and those kinds of processes so that's kind of like again it's one of it's one of those many examples of like you know, there's many, many more things between heaven and earth that are dreamt up in your philosophies, Horatio. Like you, you, if you don't really, I, I go to a mechanic when my car has trouble. I'm not a mechanic. I know a bunch and I've had to learn a lot more because I'm a responsible car you owner. But like it's only get you so far. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. There's counter, um, there's, there's counterintuitive things all the time. And I feel like that's the best that when people are having a, uh, people are trying to oversimplify, I like to say like, how many counter have you ever encountered something that was counterintuitive you have right so obviously we should consider that right like oh oh suddenly we don't have to worry about any of that i just will grow like we did six thousand years ago and it's fine and it's like all right well a lot of people uh, would die prematurely back then for a bunch of reasons we would find silly now uh cannabis farm md which we both know i'm sure who we both know uh says that and just because the spores don't grow on a plate doesn't mean that they won't grow in our lungs right very true would be nice to have some data on what a dangerous level is um cause micro oh because microbes always lingering around okay i didn't get that last part quite i'm not quite sure what's being said that that end point but uh i mean i agree with the sentiment <laughs> i agree with the sentiment at yeah. that point yeah, I mean, there's a lot that we don't know about molds. Like, a lot of what we do know is from occupational exposures, right? Not breathing in something that we're combusting and directly inhaling, but, like, being in an environment where you are breathing in a lot of mold spores or bringing in, breathing in a lot of dust that contains microbial bits and yeah. pieces. You know, agricultural dust. I'll tell you what, that shit will activate anybody's immune system. If you're working in grain silos, like my uncle oh, had yeah. COPD and he worked in grain silos his whole life and he died from COPD. So like, that's another example. It's not just the plant bits and pieces, it's the micro bits and pieces that can cause harm. And we don't know that much about, you know, like Aspergillus fumigatus, for example, which is probably the worst of all Aspergillus species. It, um, there's no infectious dose. So you can't be like, you can't, an infectious dose is established when you like treat mice with something and you're like, okay, at this dose of spores, I can kill half of the mice. You know, that hasn't right. been established for Aspergillus and it's an opportunistic pathogen. So it probably won't, you know, unless you have an immune compromised mouse model, which there are several, um, you probably won't be able to get those numbers. And so we have to make our best guess on what is recommended for these occupational settings or for indoor environments. And when you look at indoor air quality, the regulations which aren't enforced, I would say more like recommendations are that you don't have any viable CFUs floating around from Aspergillus in your air, like period. Yeah, and I mean, that doesn't thing. mean that they're not some there, but it, you're not supposed to, so. Yeah. Another thing with like uh, the dust you've reminded me is like uh, there's even viruses that um, will plant viruses, for example, that will get into like dust and they will be where they would normally have been like denatured or damaged from like UV light or something over just being like cooked by the sun. Uh, if they get they're so small, they get to like dust conglomerations, conglomerations or whatever, and they'll travel like great distances. Now, most plant viruses are they are passed through 
to insects usually, but not always. And certainly some of them can move through this way and not just viruses, but also obviously fungal and bacterial spores and things like that. So like when you mentioned that, it's like, yeah, it's just this, this nice ball of, of, um, of, of a, a carnicopia of various things that will probably stimulate your immune system. Yeah, I mean, things hitchhike. You're going to hitchhike on something like a spore. Like, uh, there was a recent um, publication that came out that showed another plant virus can hitchhike on pollen and move from from species to species. There's some, I don't know, I had, uh, shoot, I can't remember what the fungal pathogen was, but on my hawthorn tree, I had this fungal pathogen, and it was gnarly as hell. I should post some videos about it. But it travels, like, some of these pathogens will actually, they won't, the spores themselves won't be able to travel as far, but they'll hitchhike on, like, a pollen grain, which is a little bit bigger, yeah. and times bigger, and then move on, or dust. And, like, some of these allergens that I'm studying right now, like dust mite allergens, they can, the allergens can remain allergenic for 10 years in dust. It can sit in dust, and 10 years. Years later, if you kick up that dust or shake that blanket out, you're gonna like be sneezing and coughing and having a, a big old dust mite fit. So I think that that's another thing is like, you know, I'm always surprised by microbes and by life in general. There's always something crazy nutso that's happening. And I think um, knowing that and knowing like there's, there's what we don't know, there's what we know, and this is how we connect the dots so that we protect people and we want to connect the dots as conservative as possible to protect people as much as possible and that's the way that i really think about a lot of these things um but we also don't want to make things so inhibitory that um you know the natural microbiome that lives on plants and lives on you and me um would would necessarily be considered harmful because then we are yeah. living in that bubble boy situation that you're talking about right. and that's not good for us either so yeah <laughs> gabe's motives makes a mildly humorous comment i think which is that on the flip side of the uh, of that there's a lot not a lot of people dying from molds and cannabis care to opine I mean, I don't know. People is that so, is that? I mean, I'll just say I'll respond first. Like, is that? So, um, I mean, I feel like what kind of a comment is that? Like, there's not a lot of people dying from where? From where are you extracting this data? Yeah, and, that's. And do you really think cannabis research is not like? Think about this for a little bit. Is there a whole lot of it out there? Not really. Um, so like, again, I just feel like that's not a very informed point and kind of the whole reason for the reasons I have these live streams with tests. Now, this is number two is because like, it's about being proactive about something that could happen and certainly has happened in other agriculture. I didn't bring this data point up, but I'll bring this up here. Like, uh, millions of people died in the Soviet Union because a bunch of grain got infected. It's a very famous case. Um, Tess maybe knows about it better than I do, but I know enough to say that like, like these things can happen and, you know, do we have to have like a, a massive like epidemic um, of cases before we make some sort of a, a point or do we take like what we know that's 99% true from like plants and other agricultural products and then apply that to another agricultural product because cannabis, although it has a lot of great benefits, and is special to many people culturally, financially, but also, uh, you know, spiritually and other sorts of ways, uh, you know, that, that doesn't make it immune from things that are just the physical reality of how plants and how our immune systems function, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, I get a lot of pushback, like, how could I be allergic to cannabis? It's like a magical plant. I'm like, right. your immune system right. don't give no fucks. <laughs> no. If it develops an allergy against it, it's going to be allergic to it. There could be other things that exacerbate it, or you could be allergic to molds or other stuff that's in the grow environment, but it's very well established that there are allergens produced by cannabis plants. You know, yeah. that doesn't... It almost not, can't not, not be magical. the case, right? You know? It almost can't not be the case, wouldn't you say? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, a lot of... These plants all, like we were saying, they share similar proteins. You're going to... There could be cross-sensitization there. And then as far as like, you know, 
uh, infections from cannabis smokers, there are some cases that have been out there um, that have been published in these case studies. So doctors will have a patient and they'll come down with aspergillosis or cryptococcus neoformans infection or pseudomonas aeruginosa infections. All of them have been associated with cannabis smoking um, and some in, in, in healthy individuals as well, but most were immune compromised. And so you get infections, you don't know if it's exactly from the plant, the plant matter that you smoked, um, but it's associated, right? So we have to understand cause like, you know, correlation is not causation, but it warrants enough uh, worry to put in some prevention. Um, and, and like you said, there's no centralized database for these adverse effects or events from cannabis. So you can smoke something, get a headache, feel sick, and you don't know why, and there's no place you can go to report it. While, yeah, while, exactly. Yeah. And that happens. I've had people tell me, like, I smoked weed and got a really bad headache, and I don't know why. And I was like, well, you probably smoked something that was contaminated with probably microbes, because that's the one thing that you can't, che- well, you can cheat by remediating nowadays. But, um you know, well, you could, choose a, you could choose the pesticide they don't test for, too. That's true. If we're being true. electorally honest. That is honest. true. Especially a lot right. of these minimum risk pesticides that are sort of everyone casts the blind eye to them. Or it could be byproducts that are generated during oxidation from some of these other um, oxidizers that are used on the cannabis flower itself, too. We don't know. But the thing is, is because we don't know, we don't know because no one's creating a place for all of these adverse events to be sourced. I can go on to the FDA website and look at all of the adverse reactions that have happened from dog food or dog treats and see the thousands of dogs that have had different types of vomiting or diarrhea. I can go and look and bin all that information. I can even see that a couple of people ate dog treats and got sick, but I can't (laughs) get any of that information for cannabis. And that is super frustrating from a scientific point of view, from a medical point of view. There's really no place to get that. And so doctors are doing their best to report it when they see it. Scientists like me are doing our best to draw from parallels and say this is an inhalation risk. It's different than eating something. It's different than breathing it in a normal everyday situation. And that's the best we can do right now. Um, Again, if we want to protect consumers, I think everyone agrees you should not have moldy product being inhaled when you can't burn moldy firewood you shouldn't burn a moldy weed if, if you know and like that's the thing that gets me is like it doesn't it doesn't have it does not in any way have to be the case that uh you know people will link directly to cannabis i think that's a super non-starter nothing burger of a thing to say because like again we already know how the plant we already know how the human immune response is to a lot of these things and like you said they're already shared so it's already the case it doesn't really matter what you say after that then it's like are you going to be willfully ignorant about the fact that some people will have these effects and no not just immunocompromised people and think of it like a i like to think of it like a health bar you know for people who play video games or things like that um you know like you don't don't know what your health bar it's not like there's like a number oh, up yeah. the top on the, on the, you know there's not like, you don't know lately so i get you, you get a lot you of do, heart right? yeah. you know when you or go down like, into the desk <laughs> if, if not if not a health bar at least a uh sort of um you know like a like a sheet like a shield or something like over time that degrades and you don't know how much you're starting with you don't know what right. you've done to yourself that like has degraded that Yeah, and that's the difference between also acute risks, which are these living microbes that can come in and infect you directly, and the chronic risks, which are associated with their bits and pieces and their immunogenic components, uh, their bioactive agents, ergosterol, LPS, allergens, stuff like that. That is going to be an exposure over a longer period of time that's going to be linked with more chronic diseases. And we definitely see more chronic diseases, especially chronic pulmonary diseases, associated with cannabis smokers. So that is something that is not disputable. I mean, there's a smoker's lung for a reason, cough to get off for a reason. Like there's a higher incident of COPD in cannabis smokers and COPD is linked in many cases 
with not only the burning of, of combusted materials, but also these bioactive agents. Yeah, so, so it's not that's really, really cannabis. It's just the smoking, right? Like it's it's the smoking. It's the smoking, right? I mean, part of it. Yeah. I mean, a big part of it, right? It's a big part of it, I think, and that's and it's the chronic risk that I think we don't. The acute risk, yeah, there's cases here and there. Somebody gets infected with something that they breathed in, but the chronic risks, I think, are that's what kills smokers of of tobacco. You know, you don't get a lot of people who are dying, dropping dead after smoking a cigarette. It's because they smoked for a long period of time and there is like no control in tobacco on the microbial bio burdens that are there. I also, I had a conversation with a friend, you know, like, uh, and and there's like a huge difference. Uh, This is something I'm not as familiar with, but I do know enough to know that like, I mean, tobacco industry right like i don't think we have to get it i don't I think a lot of people are familiar with it and some of its uh problems in the past but like um you don't have to be the marlboro man to recognize that like uh like i drink tea okay i'm kind of a, a tea person tea aficionado connoisseur a little bit i like loose leaf tea that's like the typical form you get like the good tea and if it's loose leaf you get uh, what what tea bags tea bags with like fannings what we call the fannings or little bits and particulates that's like the cigarette that's like the cigarette tobacco of the tea world that's like (laughs) that's like the more than shake that's like the shake and then like whatever drops out of the shake almost (laughs) and it's like i don't want to be not to be a snob but like that's the like there's probably a huge difference between like if you were to like grow your own tobacco for example dry it yourself cure it yourself roll it into a cigar and smoke it way different way di- i'm not going to say that's a panacea and that it will cure all your illnesses and all these other problems of course but um i just think that's like a huge difference that like yeah needs like to be it's all about minimizing too. the yeah minimizing the risks that you know are going to be on there you can't do too much about burning something that those right. are going to create combustion products but you can do a lot to control the microbes that are on there um, so that's, again, I, and like Zamir Punja, uh, a researcher up in Canada, he just came out with a paper just a couple weeks ago. Sorry, there's lightning outside and now my dogs are scratching at the door because they're scared. Oh boy. Um, <laughs> um, I bet there'll be a pollen, pollen bursting here with all the lightning that's going right. on. But he, he showed in a greenhouse, so he did three years of testing um tested like over 2000 samples of of flour in its last week of flour uh so like fresh flour and then dry cured flour and he showed that on average growing in a greenhouse he got like below 5000 cfu per gram total yeast and mold and he showed all the things like they went through and meticulously showed all of the factors that contributed to microbial contamination. So we have a pretty, we're getting a much better understanding of what's contributing to these things. And so when people fail now, it's like you failed because you weren't doing anything right. I better, I better save my dog. Are you okay? Oh, they're both in here. They're like, help! It's, <laughs> it's lightning out there. But yeah, so it's. Oh, do you want to go back out now? Or you want to stay with me? So I think that it's, and then we can pull from other industries too, right? Like it's, there's microbial control measures that you can take that don't have to be pharmaceutical level. I mean, that's kind of over the top, but they can be, you know, the similar things that breweries do to prevent contamination, similar things that food manufacturers do. So it's just, now I think when people fail, there's a lot of information out there on avoiding failing. So we got to start taking that information and putting it into action. And you said it, you know, if there are people who are curious about this, I know not only in your great video, uh, which was sort of the impetus for the live streams so far that we've had, and hopefully some more uh, in the future, um, you know, you make some of the points of like, like I even told you, I asked you straight up, like, so you're against organic growing and we should only grow in controlled <laughs> environments because that's how people mischaracterize it. And of course, your answer was a resounding no, which should be obvious from the way that you grow yourself personally, you know, yeah. um, right. So like to, to me, I use my own so, compost in, in my grow and I use like all sorts of, yeah, 
Because you hate yourself yeah. and you want to get infected lungs, right? <laughs> no, because, you know, like, yeah. And I think uh, people are validly, very legitimately um, criticizing some of these uh, points that even you made in your own video, which people can check out at Rogue Micro. Microbe, Rogue Microbe LLC micro. on YouTube. Just Micro. Just Micro. I always get that mixed <laughs> up. But um, that's okay. You, that's okay. you can check that out on YouTube. You can also check out our previous live stream on my YouTube. And this live stream will also go on my YouTube channel, Zenthan. Also, if you're curious uh, to learn more, we'll also have the, the great diagrams that, that Tess brought up, um, that, that she brought up during the beginning of the live stream. But I think that, like, that's the thing is like, even you are super critical and many and several other people i know kind of uh, adjacent or directly in the industry of like safety with regards to um you know microbial and bio burden effects and it's like uh you know you guys also have great criticism so it's not really it's not that like these people are coming out of the woodwork as is often characterized as like um you know some sort of like control fiend uh who wants to just destroy the industry that is uh, not what's happening. Um, yeah. So what are some of the big, crit I know that you're gonna win a lot of friends if they actually listen to what you say. If like you give me a couple, maybe give me like three short, simple, I do wanna go at some point I, soon. Uh, you no, know, I could talk to you all night, me, but I should probably, too. I should probably take care of my shivering dog that is terrified of <laughs> sitting in my chair with well, give me, me a, and shivering. Give terrified. me a lightning round. I agree, give me a lightning round of a couple of things you would change um uh that people that they do now for like uh testing and regulations that you think are like just totally draconian uh that mm. even you criticize i'd be because i think that's what people like to uh, the people would like to know what you mean when you're criticizing these things or they might not realize you are yeah well and one thing i'll say too is like i'm a scientist so i'll change my mind when new data is presented but right now i'm go. making the, the best educated guests based on the evidence that's available and based on my expertise in microbiology, my research in aerobiology and my experience in cannabis manufacturing and food manufacturing. So that's how I lay it out. And people don't always agree with me and that's fine because that's also part of getting better and growing. So if they sure. don't agree with me, if they have data and they're wanting to exchange that data or ideas, then that really promotes a, a place of learning. If they're just arguing to argue, that's not uh, super productive. Yeah. So what I, would, what I would love to see in this industry is, and I'm gonna be talking about this actually at the Cannabis Research Conference later this week, I'm presenting on this, um, is that we stop relying on quality by testing and start using quality by design so what that means is right now you can basically grow and do whatever you want in your cultivation and post-harvest processes there's a couple exceptions there's some pesticides you're not supposed to use sure. you know sure. everything must be logged in your trace and track system there's also some other random stuff with diversion they really care about people not stealing but they don't care so much about building in prevention into your process and requiring that. So quality by design is, um, is exactly that. It is going through your entire process and building in quality and prevention into every step to assess and address risks that are there. So for example, like Zamir Punja, his paper shows, here's like 10 things that cause microbial contamination. If you are going in a quality by design practice, which is also implemented in the Food Safety Modernization Act or FISMA for, for food by the FDA, you have to go in and build an entire flow of your entire process. And oh, I every saw that step, paper. Yeah, yeah. And at every step, you're like, okay, you know, it's known that cocoa harbors, you know, like 70% of it's coming in with aspergillus. Okay, either I tell my supplier they need to control that risk and I require them to do a heat treatment or to steam sterilize or whatever. And then they give me a C of A showing that it doesn't have aspergillus in it or I need to control that risk. And when I'm filling up pots, I soak in Xeritol or I do something else that is going to control that risk. So that's, I mean, and it's a huge, cocoa is a huge source of contamination for aspergillus. So if you're feeling for aspergillus, it's might might be from there. 
So if you can put in those preventive controls, either again by requiring your supplier to do it, putting in process preventive controls, making sure you're removing dead leaf litter, um, dead plants, infected plants, good sanitation, you can really get around a lot of these issues that we see with quality through testing, which is basically as long as it passes testing, who cares what happened to it? It could have been covered in powdery mildew and covered in, in high t TYM counts, but you just zapped it with a radiation, so now it passes. So quality by testing passed it, but quality by design would never have passed that product because it like would that. have failed yeah. way up the stream. So and that's really what I'd like to see the industry move towards. Not only is it better for the end product, but it's going to save money in the long run. You're not going to be putting out buyers all the time because you know your shit along the entire process. So I think, that's I think my like spiel. You said, oh, I appreciate it. <laughs> I appreciate that answer because like, and I think that like, uh, I think it's totally discordant with the, with like, like I said, like the framing that like, you know, these regulations are uh, meant to, uh, you know, kill the businesses and things like that. I mean, maybe, I mean, for the regulatory advice, who knows? I don't know what they're doing. But what I do know is that, like, this, a lot of this stuff is based off the things that are true. And they're, they're true, whether it's cannabis or tobacco or pineapples or something else, you know, it's about how our body's reaction to these things happen. And, sure. and like you say, like, I also think that, you know, the key to make everything happy for the customer, for the grower, you know, and for the for the industry and just for people growing in general who want to do it safe more safely, having a sort of a setup or an ecosystem where in which like the grower is not more disadvantaged, where it's more like you put the onus on the different suppliers. Like if you know, like you said with cocoa, like I really like that idea. Like instead of I mean, sure. At the end of the day, the grower is responsible for the product that they produce. That's certainly true. But like you say, by design, if we could set it up so that the growers have less and less to worry about, um, you know, then I think that is better in the end. And I also yeah. um, and I think that like in case people like in case people get twisted, I don't think that you're saying and feel free to correct me. But I don't think that you're saying that this always has to be in a CEA controlled environment agriculture system. I think that even in outdoor, uh, like there's people who do it. There's people who do it. And is yeah. it because they're in the right place? Maybe. Is it because it's the right place in the right process? You know, perhaps. I'm sure there are places where it's more difficult to do this yes, and to, to do. do it. You know, so, yeah, yeah. And like that's the, that's the other thing that I think is like a, and that's something like that I think is like an agricultural reality. Yeah. That like, but I mean, and that's true of like grapes are grown in certain regions because it's just better to grow them there you know like yeah. i think that that might be the case for a lot of outdoor situations but even dr punja's work was in a greenhouse yeah. and his levels yes. were all really low so yeah. yeah and you know i don't want to set i don't want regulators to set uh regulations so stringent that you can't pass like right illinois their cfu counts uh levels are a thousand cfu some people can get there, but that's pretty inhibitory towards the natural microbiome that's on the plant. And so I don't agree with that limit. I don't think that that's actually set, because we want to set limits that are going to protect consumers while also understanding the that, you know, you can make this product without having to remediate it. And I also was in a CDPHE meeting here in Colorado where one of the big MSOs wanted to start mandating remediation. And I was like, hell no. <laughs> So, like, that's another, I do think that there is going to be a little bit of push and pull and people are going to say they're making safe product, but there's absolutely no evidence that remediating product makes it safer. All it does is pass testing. Again, compliance by testing versus compliance by design or quality by testing versus quality by design. And if we don't really focus on how we're doing this, then we're going to continue to have these arguments about like oh well as we're doing this in the air oh well a thousand i i think everything should be remediated well that's just going to force out the little guy which it is so it will, that, yeah. but until we actually put in good practices and enforce them it's gonna be it's people are just gonna all they're gonna focus on is passing testing and that's it how many times do i need to how long do i need to run this through the rad source you know 24 hours 48 hours i just got to get it passing who cares 
Yeah. People will buy it. It's on the shelves. People will smoke it. It'll be off the shelves in a week. Like, I've heard all of these statements by leaders at these companies. So it's uh, it's concerning to me. Kind of ghoul- and until we ghoulish, to be honest. It's ghoulish, it's totally ghoulish, <laughs> but not goulash because that's delicious. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, it, yeah uh, no, I appreciate that's my, it. Yes, but thank you so much for inviting me. I always enjoy our conversations. I know we were just gonna chat for like an hour and end up being two hours. I'm t- and it totally flew by. It did. So it did. I appreciate it, Matt. You um, always bring really good conversation and your listeners are always asking really good questions. And I hope that we can all, you know, move forward together. Yeah, I, I look forward to all of our mutual success in that avenue. And I think even the people who are maybe upset, totally, again, I want to emphasize legitimately frustrated by these like truly like draconian and in a lot of cases, I think misguided. But I think it's kind of like, I actually don't think it's typically conspiratorial. It really bothers me when people think it's conspiratorial when it could just be the the gestalt like fact of like 20, you know, like 200 plus people who are all like trying to figure out what's the right way to go about things. And everyone has their own little biases and things like that. So they might think one way or another. Um, I don't think it's like this, uh, because that would be too simple for one thing. It'd be way too simple. And there's people who talk about why uh, conspiratorial thought um you know it is uh it's not always i mean sometimes they're they're right right sometimes the conspiracies are right but uh thinking that everything is just like this cabal of people who are just keeping you down um it is actually unfortunately the tragedy of humanity is that's usually more complicated than that unfortunately but thanks for being on to talk about some of that stuff and i'm sure we'll have another one and again if people want we're having trouble looking at the graphics yeah you can find it on uh, my YouTube channel, this live stream will go up in a few days probably, and you should check out Rogue Micro LLC on YouTube for that great presentation. What's the presentation called? Oh, shoot. I guess uh, just Cannabis Allergens? Yeah. 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 You search <laughs> that on YouTube, you'll, you'll find it. You'll find You'll see tests. Oh, you'll find oh, I have a couple of videos up, but one oh. is uh, the risks, microbial risks to cannabis consumers. And then there's another video that talks about aspergillus testing in cannabis. So those are probably the two that people care about. But I also have some on like comparing dog food manufacturing to cannabis manufacturing. And I've done some secret shopper videos here in Denver um, and done getting home. So check them out. They're on YouTube. Nice, nice. I will check that one out. I think that's very fun and interesting. So thanks, everyone. Thanks for the good questions, everyone. And uh Again, I look forward to everyone's mutual success. Have a good one. Bye. Bye, Matt. Thank you.